Greetings, this is Greg. It's time to discuss turbocharging in World War II airplanes and include comparisons to the advanced multi-stage supercharger configurations in use by the U.S. Navy during the war. Turbocharging, more correctly called turbo supercharging, was a large factor in U.S. air power doctrine before the war and a key factor in the design of many significant airplanes including the B-17, B-24, P-47, and P-38. Before we dive into the details, we need to cover some history. In the 1920s, designers of military aircraft engines started to focus on supercharging. Supercharging, by definition, forces extra air into the engine, allowing it to maintain peak rated power levels, or close to them, up to high altitudes, as high as 20,000 feet or even higher. This broad definition includes exhaust-driven turbo superchargers, but for the purpose of this video and to match common modern terminology, I'll often refer to exhaust-driven turbo superchargers as turbos or turbochargers and mechanically driven units as superchargers. It quickly became very obvious to aircraft and engine designers in every country building airplanes that supercharging in one form or another was the way forward. In 1920, NACA released a report on supercharging. This 1920 report was largely a mathematical exercise which focused on figuring out the increases in an aircraft service ceiling that could be reasonably expected from supercharging. The report concluded that an increase in service ceiling from 25,000 feet up to 37,000 feet could be expected, a gain of 50%, which was huge. This particular report is often cited in other reports, hence my decision to reference it here. By 1920, there was just no question that supercharging was the way forward for aircraft engine power. But there were many types of supercharger compressors and drive systems, and at first it wasn't clear which type would be the best. But early on, the centrifugal compressor won out in aircraft applications and in U.S.-built performance cars of the 1920s and 30s. The ideal drive system was still in question with some favoring mechanical drive and some favoring an exhaust-driven compressor, a.k.a. a turbocharger. Let's take a look at a NACA report from 1924. This particular report is NACA Report 321. It's actually a translated German report as there was a lot of crossing over of information from Germany to the United States at the time. This report shows several forms of supercharging in use during the early 1920s, although it does not offer a specific comparison of them. The first example is that of a Roots supercharger. While they don't work well in airplanes, Roots superchargers can be highly effective in cars. The Roots unit uses mechanically driven intermeshing lobes, as seen near the bottom of this image, to move air into the engine. Here's an image of a Roots installed on a Mercedes racing engine. Once again, it's mounted 90 degrees to the engine's crankshaft and driven with bevel gears. Instead of being 90 degrees off in the horizontal plane, as it would be in a BF-109, it's 90 degrees off in the vertical. With very few exceptions, centrifugal, Roots, airplane, or car, the Germans loved to drive superchargers at a 90 degree angle to the crank during this era. I have never found a complete explanation for this. The Roots supercharger just doesn't work well in airplanes and no World War II aircraft was equipped with this type of supercharger. The next type is the Zoller. Like the Roots, it has its advantages in automobiles but really never went anywhere in the aviation world. Like the roots, these were mechanically driven but used internal vanes to move the air and is often called a vane-type supercharger. Next, we have an idea that keeps coming back over and over. Remember this report was published in Germany in December of 1923. It sort of reminds me of Lucy and the football. Every 20 years or so, someone tries to run a supercharger driven by an electric motor and every time, after a lot of hype, it fails to make it into production. Today, this idea is back. Now they're calling it an electric turbocharger, which is really a misnomer since a turbocharger, by definition, is driven by a turbine. It's an electric supercharger, period. Maybe this time it will work. Automotive electrical systems are getting better, and so are batteries. I'm keeping an eye on it, but I'm not holding my breath. In any case, it certainly never worked in an airplane, so let's move on. Next, we have a centrifugal compressor driven by an exhaust turbine. This is a turbocharger. 
A Frenchman named Auguste Rateau was the first to fit such a device into an airplane. This particular setup is highly advanced with two exhaust valves per cylinder. One exhaust valve is ported to the turbine, the other bypasses the turbine. The valve timing for the valves are independent in an effort to maximize turbo performance while minimizing exhaust back pressure into the cylinder. This exhaust valve system was eventually abandoned in favor of a conventional system running all of the exhaust through the turbine. Another solution is to drive the centrifugal compressor mechanically. In this particular report, this isn't discussed, probably because of its German origins. Allow me to explain. In the early days of aviation, racing cars were just as fast or sometimes faster than airplanes. Thus, there was a lot of overlap in regards to engine technology. In the United States, the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, which opened in 1909, was the pinnacle of motor racing and had an influence on engine designs. At Indy, cars could maintain very high speeds without much need to slow down. Thus, they could operate their racing engines within a narrow range of RPM, much like an airplane. In these conditions, a centrifugal supercharger could dominate. For this reason, and some others, U.S. automakers like Duesenberg, Cord, and Auburn exclusively use the centrifugal type. This particular picture was taken before the start of the 1924 Indy 500 race, which was won by a Duesenberg. Meanwhile, in Europe, racing was quite different. They ran long endurance races on real roads. This involved a lot of variation in speed, thus power was needed through a wide range of RPM. At the time, the best way to do that was with a root supercharger, thus Mercedes, Fiat, Bentley, Alfa Romeo, and the other European manufacturers went with the roots type. So far, we have several types of superchargers in contention for use in military airplanes. So naturally, at some point, NACA had to do a comparison of these to find the best way forward, and they did just that. This brings us up to NACA report number 384, which was released January 1st of 1932. This is probably the most important NACA report with regards to World War II airplanes, at least U.S. airplanes. I believe that this report, more than any other, shaped the course of aircraft development in the U.S. and led directly to the development of the B-17, B-24, P-38, P-47, and most of the naval fighters, and indirectly the Merlin Power P-51. So let's dive into it. This report starts off by giving you the conclusion, so let's begin there. Now, I'm not going to read all of this word for word, but I'll put up the section of the report that covers what I'm saying. Of course, if you want to pause and read their exact words for yourself, please do so. By 20,000 feet, the difference between the most efficient type of supercharging and the least efficient is only about 6%. Remember, they're including turbos in their definition of supercharging. However, above 20,000 feet, the turbo supercharger equipped engine develops considerably more power than any other type. That's, quote, considerably more power, unquote. They go on to mention that the roots type was the least efficient and resulted in the least power. NACA already knew that, as they had previously done extensive testing of this type, but I think they just included it in this test for completeness. With the benefit of 2020 hindsight, of course, we know that this is shaping up to be a battle between the gear-driven centrifugal supercharger and the turbocharger. While the roots type does have some serious advantages over the other types, they just don't apply to aircraft, and it's the same with the Zoller, aka the Vane type. For these reasons, we'll be focusing on the geared centrifugal and turbo. Compared with the turbo, the geared centrifugal's method of control, which was throttling, was unsatisfactory from the standpoint of net engine power. I discussed this at great length in my F4F Wildcat video. The short version is that in order to prevent overboost at low altitudes, the throttle has to be partially closed at full power. Superchargers hate being throttled. All of this means that the turbo has a significant advantage above 20,000 feet and an advantage at lower altitudes when the geared type is throttled. This graph shows a theoretical 100 horsepower engine with various types of superchargers and with a series of units sized specifically for each altitude. In other words, it's the best case scenario for each type and at each altitude. We can see that a conventional unsupercharged engine will lose power as soon as it gains altitude. At 12,000 feet, it's down to about 62 horsepower. 
at 20,000, only 44 horsepower, and up to at 40,000 feet, it's down to only 17 horsepower. Now, let's look at the chart at the 20,000 foot mark. We can see that the geared centrifugal has about 97 horsepower, and the turbo still has 100 horsepower. Now let's remember, this is assuming in both cases that a compressor is used, sized specifically for 20,000 feet. Above that altitude, even under perfect conditions, the geared centrifugal starts to fall behind, eventually falling behind about 15% at 40,000 feet. Now you'll notice that the chart includes a line on the far right for what I'll call a magic supercharger. This is a supercharger that generates enough boost to maintain 29.92 inches of mercury all the way up to 40,000 feet without drawing any power. In other words, it creates free boost, which in the real world doesn't happen. However, it shows the power consumption of the various drive systems. For example, at 30,000 feet, this magic supercharger actually adds power, and we get about 113 horsepower. Where did this extra 13 horsepower come from on our 100 horsepower engine? Well, in this case, it came from reduced exhaust back pressure because the chart assumes ambient pressure at the exhaust outlet, which is much lower than the manifold pressure of 29.92 inches. The higher the plane goes, the greater this advantage, as is seen on the line. Compared with the geared centrifugal, or comparing the geared centrifugal with the turbo, I should say, since both have similar drive power requirements, the power numbers are actually pretty close. Of course, they both run the same compressor, so the difference is in the two drive systems, geared versus exhaust driven. Now, contrary to popular belief, the power to spin a turbo is not free, but it is efficient. To quote NACA, regarding a turbocharger, quote, the net engine power is the total engine power supercharged, less the reduction in power due to increased exhaust back pressure, unquote. Back pressure costs power and the turbo causes it. When using a geared centrifugal, power is, quote, the total power developed, less the power required to drive the supercharger, unquote. On the chart, we can see that at 30,000 feet, the drive power requirement the boost needed to maintain 29.92 inches, that's 14.7 PSI, or 1,013 millibar roughly. It's about uh, going to be about 10 PSI of boost in this case, and the drive power requirement will be about 13 horsepower for the turbo and about 20 horsepower for the geared centrifugal. That difference of 7 horsepower may not seem like much, but we need to remember that this engine only has 100 horsepower, so it's the percentages that matter here. On a 1,500 horsepower engine, that's going to be about 105 horsepower, so it's really starting to mean something. More importantly, the turbocharger doesn't cause throttling losses, which the supercharger does at any point below its critical altitude. This hugely favors the turbo. Let's look at these throttling losses next. This chart shows the net engine power of a 100 horsepower supercharged engine with six different sizes of geared centrifugal superchargers each optimized for maximum power at a specific critical altitude. Below this altitude, power suffers due to the throttling losses. Above it, suffers due to the supercharger's inability to maintain manifold pressure. Supercharger A is the low altitude supercharger. It makes its maximum power at 5,000 feet. So not much throttling is required at sea level, thus its throttling losses are only about 5 horsepower at sea level. However, it suffers greatly at higher altitudes. At 20,000 feet, it can only provide enough manifold pressure for 57 horsepower. Now, let's look at the other extreme, supercharger F. This supercharger is optimized for 30,000 feet. At sea level, it's in a world of pain. At 29.92 inches of manifold pressure, it's working against such strong throttling losses that it can only produce 68 horsepower. That's a 32% loss in power. As I've said before, superchargers hate being throttled. They have to do a lot of extra work to compress the air at the supercharger inlet because the air pressure there is so far below ambient. In other words, it has to compress more to reach a given manifold pressure value. Now up at 30,000 feet, the throttling losses are zero and the engine is putting out 95 horsepower. All the other examples are somewhere in the middle. So you can see that a geared single speed, single stage, centrifugal is going to require some serious compromises. We're going to come back to this chart in a moment and explain how it relates to U.S. naval fighters. This next chart shows the routes geared centrifugal and turbo.
all set up with single stages and geared for a 20,000 foot critical altitude. The roots seems to do well here, but that's only because this chart deals with relatively low boost levels, only what's needed to maintain sea level pressure. Again, the roots isn't really relevant to this discussion at this point. The geared centrifugal is at a huge disadvantage against the turbo below 20,000 feet here. At sea level, it's behind 80 horsepower to 100. Now, this lack of concern over throttling losses for the turbo, meaning if you're using a turbo, you're really not going to have throttling losses, that means that the designers could use the turbo and use one optimized for much higher altitudes because they didn't have to worry about sacrificing the power down low, which is what they eventually did, but we'll get to that. So far, things look pretty bad for the gear centrifugal. Its power suffers greatly from throttling down low, and it can't quite compete with the turbo up high. So why did the U.S. Navy seem to marry itself to the geared centrifugal for its planes? Well, there are two main reasons. The first is simply packaging. NACA pointed out that the geared centrifugal is compact and light, and it lends itself very well to installation in aircraft with air-cooled radial engines. Since the U.S. Navy was hell-bent on avoiding the use of liquid-cooled engines anyway, well, with the exception of uh, airships, the geared centrifugals would be easy to package into their planes. Second, the report points out that they would not be likely to be used unless either they were improved or set up in multiple stages, and that's exactly what happened. Both of those things happened prior to World War II. Thus, with multiple stages of geared superchargers and with big radial engines with plenty of room in the fuselage right behind them, the geared centrifugals were made to work really well. Not as well as a turbo, but pretty close. Now let's finish up uh, NACA 384 by reviewing the conclusions. Below 20,000 feet, there's little difference between a turbocharger and a gear-driven centrifugal. But above 20,000 feet, the turbo is superior. About two years after that report, in 1934, the U.S. Army Air Corps proposed a bomber to replace the aging B-10 shown here. The specs called for it to be able to fly at 10,000 feet for 10 hours and have a top speed of 200 miles per hour. But they also stated that they would prefer if it had a top speed of 250 miles per hour and a range of 2,000 miles. Keep in mind, in 1934, there were still a lot of biplane fighters flying around, and many of them couldn't do much over 200 miles per hour. One of our newest fighters, the Boeing Pea Shooter, could get up to about 230 miles per hour. So asking for a 250 mile per hour bomber with a 2,000 mile range was asking quite a bit. Boeing responded with a proposal for a large four engine bomber. Although turbo superchargers were not in the original prototypes, there was plenty of room in the big plane to fit them. And the first production of the plane, the B-17B, had them. When these planes started showing up in 1939, the plane had a range of 3,000 miles and a maximum speed of 292 miles per hour at 25,000 feet. This performance helped reinforce the bomber doctrine that was dominating the Air Corps at the time. Even the latest fighter, the Curtis Hawk, could not catch a B-17 at high altitude. Of course, at low altitude it could. The Hawk had a top speed of 313 miles an hour, but that was down at 8,500 feet. U.S. bomber doctrine at this point was focused and focused pretty heavily on high-altitude precision bombing. It was thought, largely because of its turbochargers, the B-17s would be almost impossible to intercept, and if intercepted by enemy fighters, they could be repelled by the firepower of the bomber formation. Of course, that's not exactly how it went, but if you look at this from the standpoint of someone in 1939, you can see the logic here. It's very difficult to package turbos into a fighter. It's easy into a bomber. And here was the B-17, able to fly at 25,000 feet. It was faster than any U.S. fighter currently in service at that altitude, and faster than most known potential enemy fighters. With the benefit of hindsight, we know that the BF-109 was among the very few fighters that were faster at 25,000 feet, and that U.S. fighters would soon be catching up. But in 1939, things were looking pretty good for the bomber. General Electric the company that made the turbochargers for the B-17 stated in a 1943 training video in regards to turbocharged bombers, quote, almost without exception, these planes have returned safely from their missions, unquote. 
That was true early in the war before we started bombing Germany. In the video, they later point out in the cases when we did lose bombers, they were usually operating below 25,000 feet, which was also true at the time. U.S. air power doctrine focused heavily on the four-engine bomber with large numbers of B-17s being built. The slightly more advanced B-24 was built in even greater numbers and was also equipped with turbo superchargers. As a side note, the B-24's pilot's manual seems to assume the pilots are just prone to being idiots. Nearly every picture in it has some sort of caption admonishing bad techniques. I don't see that very often in other publications of the time. It's pretty unique to the B-24's manual. I don't think it means anything, it's just an interesting observation. Fitting turbos and all the related piping into a four-engine bomber was relatively easy. Fitting it into a fighter was another matter entirely. The latest proposals coming from the Army Air Corps had some pretty high performance requirements, and it was felt by at least some designers that the best option to achieve their goals would be to build a fighter equipped with the turbo supercharger. Remember the Curtis P-36 Hawk from earlier? Notice it has an air-cooled radial engine. Well, we need to back up and take a detour for a moment here. Did you ever notice that all of the liquid-cooled V-type engines used in World War II were developed at about the same time? The U.S. Allison V-1710 was developed in 1929, first ran in 1930. The Germans began development of an inverted liquid-cooled V-12 in 1930, test ran it in 1931. This engine was to be the basis for the famous DB601, which first ran in 1935. Over in Britain, the Rolls-Royce Merlin first ran in 1933, and the Spanish Hispano Suiza 12Y first ran in 1932. You may not have heard of this engine, but it was used in French fighters. More importantly, was the basis for the Russian Kilmov VK-105, which powered over a dozen types of Soviet warplanes, so it was very widely used during the war. All throughout aviation history, until the advent of the jet, there was this seesawing battle going back and forth between air-cooled radials and liquid-cooled V-types. And in the 1920s, generally speaking, the big radials were favored. So what was it that caused this sudden development of all of these engines? With the exceptions of the U.S. Navy and the Japanese, most countries suddenly focused development on planes that were going to have liquid-cooled V-types. The tide had shifted against the air-cooled radial. It might surprise you to learn that this switch was not caused by some new engine technology or manufacturing techniques. It was the advent in 1926 of ethylene glycol. This new coolant allowed for smaller cooling systems, thus less cooling system drag, and that was enough to give the liquid-cooled engines just enough performance advantage so that they had an edge on the radials. Although it would later switch back, that's another story. This takes us back to the Curtis P-36 Hawk. It was designed before the Allison V-12 was really ready for prime time. The Hawk first flew in 1935. In 1937, Curtis made one of the first attempts to build a turbocharged fighter, and here it is. This is the P-37. It is essentially a P-36 with an Allison V-12 and the entire turbo system located between the engine and the cockpit. You can see how far back they had to move the cockpit. The plane had too many technical issues to resolve, so they removed the turbo, kept the liquid-cooled engine, moved the cockpit forward again, and developed it into the P-40. And so ended the Curtis Wright Corporation's attempts to build a turbocharged fighter. Let me ask you a question. What U.S.-built plane was primarily flown by the leading Allied ace of the war? Well, it was this man. Alexander Pokrishkin, and this Soviet pilot scored 47 of his 65 kills in the P-39 Era Cobra. The P-39 represents Bell Aircraft's attempts to build a turbocharged fighter. This time, instead of moving the cockpit back, they decided to move the engine back instead, way back, as in behind the cockpit. The idea was that would leave more room behind the engine and allow for a streamlined nose with heavy nose-mounted weaponry and a forward cockpit. The problem was that it didn't leave a lot of room, and there were cooling problems that were never resolved. This is actually quite a long story about all this, but the short version is that they gave up, and like the Curtis P-40, they just made do with an Allison V-12 and its built-in single-stage, single-speed 
low boost supercharger. Thus, like the P40, the P39 was useless at medium and high altitudes. About this time, the aircraft for the U.S. Navy were getting multi-stage, multi-speed superchargers. Allison was sort of put in an awkward position here. They knew that the U.S. Navy was not going to purchase a carrier-based plane with a liquid-cooled engine, yet the Army Air Corps clearly wanted a turbocharged fighter. So initially, they didn't bother developing a multi-stage or multi-speed supercharger for use in fighters. They relied on others to build the turbochargers and the airplanes. This hurt Allison greatly when the P-51 came around, and it's the main reason they had to use the Merlin. Let's move on. If there is one way to be sure to have enough room for your turbocharger, it's to simply build a really big airplane. That's exactly the method used by the Republic Aircraft Company for their P-43 Lancer. This worked. The airplane had acceptable but not great high altitude performance. However, it was really obsolete about the time it entered production, so it was only produced for about one year. The importance of this plane is primarily that it led to the P-47 Thunderbolt, which we'll get to. Following along the idea of making the plane really big, well, we can make it even bigger by using two engines. Lockheed introduced the P-38 with twin Allisons, each packing a turbo in the boom behind the engine. In principle, this was a great idea. In execution, had some issues. The P-38 was incredibly complex. More importantly, and a lot of people don't know this, this was Lockheed's very first attempt at building a combat airplane. And they really dove in head first on this. They did a remarkable job, and it was the first fighter to exceed 400 miles per hour in level flight. However, the early versions had a lot of issues, mostly related to operations in sub-freezing temperatures. That made the plane a bit impractical at high altitudes, especially high altitude over Europe thus defeating the whole idea of using turbochargers in the first place. The plane had tremendous success in the Pacific, and eventually its issues were resolved, but by then the decision had already been made to replace them in Europe with P-51s. Thus, the P-38 was never really able to show what its turbos could do when up high. The whole P-38 story is so complex that it will need its own video, so let's move on. Now, before we get to the non-U.S. airplanes that were turbocharged, we need to talk about the P-47 Thunderbolt. Building on the lessons from the P-43 Lancer, Republic went with a big fuselage and put the turbo and intercooler in the back, ran ducting all over the place, and boosted manifold pressure like there was no tomorrow. Even early versions could boost enough to maintain full manifold pressure up to 27,000 feet. When delivery started in late 1942, the P-47, with its top speed of about 430 miles per hour, was the fastest combat airplane in the skies, at least at high altitudes. Further development resulted in combat versions with top speeds over 470 miles per hour, and test versions that it could exceed 500 miles per hour. Those, of course, were never operational. As with the P-38, this plane needs about a one-hour video to really explore the design. Now, both Germany and Japan used turbochargers and experimented with them at least to some extent. I don't know of a single German turbocharged combat aircraft from World War II. However, the Germans were familiar with turbocharging, and they built many types of aircraft, and within those, many subtypes and variations of the subtypes. So there may have been a small number of turbocharged fighters or bombers at some point in the war, but I haven't found any solid evidence of this, just some vague references. They did, however, absolutely build a turbocharged reconnaissance airplane. It was a diesel-powered version of the Ju-86. None of these still exist, a diesel-powered version, that is. Here's a picture of the Yumo 207, which powered the airplane. Now, the Japanese were at least somewhat interested in turbocharging. They built an A6M30 with a turbocharger for testing. It never flew. Its engine configuration is shown here. Then they built an airplane which you could almost call a Japanese P-47. It was the Ki-87 or Ki-87. It had performance much like an early P-47 Thunderbolt. Probably had a lot of potential, but they only built a single example because it first flew in April of 1945, just too late to get that into production for the war. We need to look at what the U.S. Navy was doing so we can have a comparison between their multi-stage superchargers and turbochargers. 
Of course, there is never a perfect apples to apples comparison, but I think I have two planes that are pretty close here, both the F4U-1 Corsair and the P47B Thunderbolt use the R2800 engine and both develop 2,000 horsepower. Let's take a look at the supercharger configuration used in the F4U-1 Corsair. The system uses dual superchargers with high and low speeds on the second stage. It's almost exactly like the setup explained in my F4F Wildcat video, just a lot bigger and badder. So in effect, even though not literally, the Corsair has three superchargers. Note, in this picture, the far side intercooler is not shown. It does have two. Again, uh, watch my Wildcat Part 1 video if you want a more complete explanation of, of how this is laid out, because it's essentially identical. Now let's go back to one of the previous NACA charts and graph the horsepowers of the Corsair on this chart. Of course, this chart is for a 100 horsepower engine, but that's okay. We can use it in terms of percentage. Unfortunately, the data out there for the Corsair-1 is a bit incomplete. The peak power numbers for each stage and related critical altitudes, those are straight out of the World War II era flight manual, so they're as accurate as you can get. However, Chance Vought didn't give much more data than that, so I had to borrow the throttling curves for the losses there and the power drop-off with altitude from Grumman's data for the F6F Hellcat. That data was much more complete. The, this version of the Hellcat uses an engine that's almost identical to the Corsair. Both are R2800s with 2,000 horsepower at the same manifold pressure settings. The main difference being one has an updraft, the other has a downdraft carburetor, and there's some packaging differences for the intercoolers. My point here is that this may be off by 50 horsepower or so at certain points, but the peak numbers are dead accurate. So we'll use the Corsair's military power rating of 2,000 horsepower since it works really well on a percentage scale. The Corsair-1's big R2800 engine can put out as much as 2250 at war emergency power. At military power, the Corsair's main stage blower, which is always engaged and shown here by the green line, can maintain its full 2000 horsepower to 2500 feet. This stage is heavily biased for low-level activity. Notice in this case it will maintain that 2000 horsepower all the way down to sea level because the designers allowed it to run with slightly more manifold pressure below 2,500 feet at military power to offset the throttling losses. Above 2,500 feet, the Corsair will lose manifold pressure and power will start to drop off. But at about 5,500 feet, depending on the atmospheric conditions that day, the pilot can engage the auxiliary supercharger, often called the aux blower, into low speed. This will enable the engine to regain manifold pressure, and as the aircraft climbs, the throttling losses will be reduced. In this configuration, the engine will have 1,800 horsepower when this stage reaches its critical altitude of 18,500. From there, the high speed on the aux blower can be engaged, and this will enable the plane to keep its manifold pressure up to about 23,000 feet, at which point the engine will have 1,650 horsepower. From there, power will increase, correction, power will decrease pretty significantly as the aircraft climbs. Notice the area where the lines intersect. That's sort of a gray area where it's a bit of a toss-up as to whether it's better to run the main blower and accept the decreasing manifold pressure or to engage the low speed on the aux blower and take the throttling losses. The official answer was to switch to the higher stage when full throttle manifold pressure decreased below a specific value. Note that the lines are not exactly parallel to those predicted by NACA. There are several reasons for that. But it's mainly because superchargers improved over that 10-year period in regards to throttling losses. Power above the critical altitudes doesn't quite keep up with the predicted numbers due to the installation in the actual airplane. When you actually put something in a real airplane, it's going to behave a little bit differently than it did on the test bench. So the Navy's solution was big radial engines and two stages of supercharging with two speeds on the auxiliary stage blower. And the Army Air Corps, by and large, was to go with the turbocharger. Let's take this opportunity to compare the Corsair's excellent supercharging system with that of the land-based P-47B Thunderbolt. The P-47B uses the R2800 with a single-speed, single-stage main blower, just like the Corsair.
but instead of a second stage two speed supercharger, the Thunderbolt uses a turbo. Now, before I post the Thunderbolt's power, I have to make something clear. These are not war emergency power numbers for either airplane. We're not trying to compare airplanes here, just the differences as they relate to the turbocharger. The Corsair's numbers are for military power. The Thunderbolts are for emergency maximum. These two ratings are the same thing. They both have almost identical manifold pressure values, 52 inches for the Thunderbolt, 53 for the Corsair, and both have the same five minute limitation. They only differ in name because of different manufacturers and one is US Navy, the other is US Army Air Corps or Army Air Force, depending on what year we're talking about. As you'll see, while both have 2,000 horsepower ratings, the two systems yield very different results. So here it is. The Thunderbolt is shown via the gray line and it maintains its full 2,000 horsepower from sea level all the way up to 27,000 feet, where it will have a 600 horsepower advantage over the Corsair. From there, power drops off, but it's still very strong. I think this chart shows the power advantage of the turbo supercharger. It's not just about the power at altitude, although that is a big factor. It's about the ability to vary the speed of the supercharger independently of the crankshaft in order to maintain power throughout a large altitude range. Of course, it's not all sunshine and rainbows for the turbo. This comes at a tremendous penalty in packaging requirements, which is why the Thunderbolt's fuselage is so fat and the Corsair's is so skinny. Plus, the Corsair had some extra, extra packaging trips to help keep it sleek, which are described in my video on Corsair design features. On the P-47 side, its drag isn't as high as you might think. In fact, its overall drag is about equal to the Corsair. You see, at this time, most designers were using NACA wings. However, a few years earlier, when Republic aircraft was still Seversky aircraft, Alexander Seversky himself decided he was going to design his own wing. He came up with the Seversky S3 airfoil, which it turns out was really good. In yet another test done later, uh, so the wing was competing against later designs, but this wing had the lowest drag of all the conventional wing designs that were tested, although not lower than the newest low drag types from NACA, but those weren't available at the time they were designing the P-47. At the power settings we've been using, at 25,000 feet, the Corsair has a speed of 390 miles per hour, just over 400 miles per hour according to some reports, versus 420 for the Thunderbolt. Just for the record, the performance numbers of early Corsairs, the F4U-1s, are all over the place. Reports vary by about 20 miles per hour at altitudes. Some of those are referencing a very cleaned up Corsair that had some special low drag modifications. You have to kind of watch that, but in any case, we're talking about operational combat variants here. At 30,000 feet, the Corsair can only manage about 365 miles per hour. Still really good though but the, 420, the Thunderbolt can go 426 miles per hour at 30,000 feet. So at high altitude, the Thunderbolt is faster, a lot faster. Now at lower altitudes, because horsepower is very close and drag is fairly close with a slight advantage going to the Corsair, uh, it's much closer. At 52 inches of manifold pressure, both airplanes run about 350 miles per hour at sea level with a slight edge going to the Corsair. Overall, the two planes are pretty even in speed until about 20,000 feet. Now, it's time to summarize all of this. After NACA released Report 384 in 1932, in January of 32, the designers of aircraft which would be used by the U.S. Army, the U.S. Army Air Corps, began focusing heavily on turbocharging because the idea of a fast, high-flying four-engine bomber fit neatly into their doctrine, and it was relatively easy to turbocharge big airplanes. Subsequent proposals for fighters required them to have enough performance to be able to climb high enough and go fast enough to intercept potential turbocharged enemy bombers, although none ever existed. Many companies tried to build a turbocharged fighter, but it was very challenging, and the only complete success was the Republic P-47 Thunderbolt. Although the P-38's early issues were eventually solved, but it was too late to take advantage of its abilities at high altitude. Now the Navy took heed of NACA 384 and naval aircraft were designed with modern multi-stage, multi-speed gear-driven centrifugals, 
for the advantage in simplicity and packaging. It also kept costs much lower. In comparing the Corsair and P47, it appears that NACA called everything about right in 1932. The Corsair's up, its performance up to 20,000 feet is on par with the much more expensive P47 and higher in some ways. But at high altitudes in 1943, the P47 Thunderbolt was king. Now turbochargers don't go much farther in terms of military aviation. The advent of the jet put the brakes on a lot of piston engine development. Some of it was pretty exciting too. But the B-29s had turbos and it could operate, I should say they could operate at 30,000 feet and in 1945 were proving very difficult to intercept and shoot down. After the war, Republic built the turbocharged Rainbow, an airliner capable of a maximum speed of 470 miles per hour with a 400 mile per hour cruise speed at 40,000 feet and a 4,000 mile range. The target was called 444, 400 miles an hour at 40,000 feet for 4,000 miles. There was also a reconnaissance version for the military, but the tremendous expense of this airplane killed it off. It was almost four times the price of a DC-6, which could fly almost as far, although at much lower speeds, typically about 300 miles per hour, and carry quite a bit more. Thus, only two rainbows were built before the project was canceled, and in my view, cancellation of the rainbow really marked the end of turbochargers in military aviation, or for that matter, high-powered aviation piston engines, period. I plan to make a full video about the P-47. I might even do that next. It's one of my favorite planes because of its technology and its ability to get you home. I'll leave you with this picture and a poem by Lieutenant E.C. Buckley, a Thunderbolt pilot. Have a great day, and I hope to see you here for my next video.